Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Nice to have you with me once again on this Sunday morning. And if you've been tracking with us over the last two weeks, we've entered into a subject into an area that I know is very foreign to us. It might seem very strange, just as grace did in the finished work of the cross and unconditional love and mercy. When we first began to get revelation of those things, they did seem so contrary to everything that we had been taught and everything that we were religiously ingrained with that it took us some time to adapt and to um, understand and to crockpot it till it really took root. And it's kind of the way with the subject we're dealing with right now. I'm talking to you, teaching you, and I'm learning myself about this whole area of immortality and eradicating death. <clears throat> And let me just say, I'm putting this out there just for you to consider. I don't want you to feel like this is a fundamental of the faith, although you know it really kind of is part of the gospel, which we're going to explore a little bit this morning. But I don't want you to be um, upset, nervous about it, anxious. It's just one of those things that you just that you just breathe in and let the spirit of truth mold and work with a little bit until we can come to some good understanding about it. So if I were to put a title on the, on the uh, teaching this morning, I would call it a new revelation. A new revelation, or how about we drink a cup of new wine this morning? And so we're gonna have to let that wineskin be a little bit flexible. We're gonna have to be a new wineskin in order to receive the new wine. I wanna begin in Genesis chapter two, verse 17 this morning, which is what God told Adam and Eve in the very beginning. And I want us to notice a couple of things out of this scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God says this to Adam and Eve. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, I read that out of the King James. Did you get the thou's and the shalt's? Let me say it again. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is when you set yourself up as the determining factor. I, this is probably, if we were to trace it, I would say it's the tree of humanism. It's the tree of self-determination. It's the tree of not simply listening to God and responding to his voice. It's where you decide what you want to do, what's right and what's wrong. And God said the day that you do it, you're going to die. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice out of this. <clears throat> Death came as a result of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the things that it encompasses that I just mentioned. This, did, this was not a punishment from God. God did not, God, God was not the force or the power that said, I will kill you if you eat from this tree. Nor did he say, I will separate myself from you if you eat from this tree. Nor did he say, you will have a sin nature if you eat from this tree. Nor did he say, everybody that is going to be born after you, all your offspring and their offspring and offspring generations are going to have a sin nature and a demic nature because of what you've done. Simple statement from God. He said, this tree is going to be the source of death. And that's really what happened. Physical death entered the human race through the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. It was not God's punishment. I want to say that again and again and again, because we have fixed in our mind from all of the, the teaching that we've heard, religious indoctrination over the years, that God more or less al allowed or killed Adam and Eve because they sinned. There's no, no mention of sin in that passage. God didn't say you had sinned. He just said, there's a consequence to your action. Paul said, the wages of sin is death. It's not a wage that God pays. It's a wage that comes from missing the mark. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil is missing the mark. The mark, the target, the bullseye is the tree of life. So when you don't eat from the tree of life, you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can I just say it simply? You miss the mark. So it is at that point that death seems to have become accepted by the entire human race as the norm. Just the thing that we have automatically accepted. Uh, there's an old saying, there's only two things for sure, and that's death and taxes. I don't know how you feel, but I just soon eliminate both of those out of my life, death and taxes. What I want to talk to you this morning is about life, and I want to talk to you about death, because I think it's an important subject, 
And it seems to be one that there's a, a wave coming in right now of understanding, revelation, of truth that's, that's challenging us and taking us down another level. Now it appears, and I, I cannot prove this from scripture, but it appears that before the consumption from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, before the, the tree of the knowledge of evil was, was, uh, was eaten from, that there was no death on the planet. I don't have a specific verse, I cannot prove that to you from scripture, but there is no evidence, there is no scripture that says plants died, animals died, uh, that there was any, any form of death on the planet before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> so if, here's my question this morning, here's what I've been wrestling with. If there was no tree of the knowledge of good and evil eating today from that tree, if we did not, if we no longer ate from that tree, and let's be honest, we eat from that tree constantly. We all make up our minds about what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, what I want to do, what I don't want to do, what I should do, what I shouldn't do. We all eat from that tree, and that's not the tree of life. The tree of life is, Father, what do you say about this? And what he says about it, when we walk with him in the cool of the evening, where he just, you're on your bed and you're communing with God, and he says, says something to you, the tree of life is you hear what he says and you just respond to it. All of us have come through this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It entered through Adam and Paul says that through one man death entered, therefore we've all sinned. We all made a choice to eat from that tree. I can't blame Adam. I make the choice. I still make that choice. I still catch myself eating from that tree. I weigh it out. I don't consult the Father. I'm not sensitive to what he says about a particular circumstance or situation. So I make up my mind what I think is the best, what is logical, what's reasonable. I may consult someone, ask their opinion, which there again, they're just gonna eat from the tree of life and tell me what they perceive to be the right action. So I'm just wondering, <clears throat> if there was no tree of the knowledge of good and evil, would death exit through the same channel that it entered? Could that be a possibility? Is it possible that the last enemy that is going to be destroyed is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? We know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 1556, I could be wrong with the address, but Paul says that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Well, if I come, if I come to the root of death, I see that it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I have to ask myself, if, there, if we stopped eating, if there's a generation, a group of people, that begin to stop eating from that tree, would death also disappear? So the point I want to make at the very start of this teaching this morning is that the tree you eat from becomes your life source. If you eat from the tree of life, then you experience Zoe. You experience the life of God, the God kind of life, which knows no death. There is no death in the God kind of life. I think we can all agree to that. There is no death in God. He is pure love, he's pure light, he's pure life. There is no darkness in him, there is no life in him. And as I said a couple of minutes ago, the tree of life for us is simply the tree of response. That's all Adam and Eve had to do, was to respond to the voice of God. They communicated every, every evening, it says they walked together in the cool of the evening, God would speak to them, they would respond. How long they lived in the garden in that situation, I have no idea of. I have, I have a hunch that it was a pretty long time before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we eat from the tree of life, that becomes our life source. On the flip side, if we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that carries the price tag of death, the tree of self-determination, the tree of making yourself the God of your life. That was never how we were wired. That was never how the Father intended for us to live. It took a long time. When Adam and Eve ate from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it took a long time for them to die physically. Same pretty much with us. We eat from that tree. We miss the target. We miss the mark. We can call that a sin. It takes a long time. You don't die that day. Uh, I'm not going to name any particular sins because I don't, I, I don't want to get into that. That's not my job to determine what is right and what is wrong for you because that's the wrong tree. What you need to do is learn to listen to the Father and partake from the tree of Zoe. But the thing is this, we all live with the expectation of the results of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We all expect that we're, we're at some point we're going to die. 
We're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna get sick. I was I was talking to um, uh, a man at the gym who's a, a doctor. He specializes in DNA, and he was explaining to me that at, at some point in life you you stop living in, in about 25, 28 years old. You actually start deteriorating, and we have seen that for generations. Our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, ancestors, all have come down that road. So that's just that's just the accepted thing. That's what. That's what we believe. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's what we believe is going to be the end product. some point, I'm going to get sick, going to get cancer, going to have a heart attack. Something's going to happen to me, and I'm, I'm going to die. Now, the reason we think that, and there's a verse from, from Romans that I think lays that out for us. Here's, here's why that happens to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. It says that as sin has reigned in death, that's the, the direct repercussion of sin, and I'm not talking about smoking, drinking, chewing, uh, eating too much sugar. I'm not talking about that. Sin is missing the mark. Let me, let me just really emphasize this because it's become so plain to me that the missing the mark is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the target, the bullseye. Remember the archer when he shoots an arrow and it misses the bullseye, it's called a sin. When we miss the bullseye, the tree of life, then we sin. And as a result of that, the wages of that sin is death. And so death has reigned through sin. Even so, watch, even so, same way. Grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So that, that verse sets up a very strong distinction. It says that, that death comes because of sin, but grace, when it reigns through righteousness, will bring us eternal life. We are people that are beginning to question, beginning to embrace that there's a level of consciousness, and quantum physics, I think, is, is opening some of this up to us, that there is a level of consciousness, a level that we can live in that takes us out of this reigning of death through sin and brings us into grace, which we've gotten a good understanding of. We're, there's more to understand with it, but this grace is going to reign through righteousness, which we are. We exchanged, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus exchanged his righteousness for our sin, and that was going to lead us into eternal life. Here's what I want us to do. I just want us to begin to embrace an idea. Just begin to think about it. Just begin to roll it over. Jesus, if we're going to be as he is in this present world, listen, Jesus never ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jesus strictly ate from the tree of life. And I want you to compare that to the way that we live our life today because most of the time we're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when that, when that death begins to set in, that sickness, generally comes through sickness, let's be honest, we get sick and then we get so sick that our body can't handle it and it gives, it's not fit to inhabit anymore, so we die. That progression, as it's happened over generations, the best that we could have ever hoped for was healing. That if you get sick, you get healed. But what I'm pondering today is healing really the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. There's no doubt that healing has, has been on the front burner for, for several generations because it's been the priority of what we felt would extend life. It was, a, it was a priority, it's a priority in, in Christian ministry today, and our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. There, there have been great men and women that have moved in that ministry of healing and have, have been uh, very proficient. I'm thinking like John G. Lake, Amy Simple McPherson, William Brandon, Oral Roberts, A.A. A. Allen, Catherine Kuhlman. I mean, the list, the list goes on. I don't, there doesn't seem to be as prevalent today as maybe it was the previous generation, but there have been people that have ministered powerfully in healing. And do you know why they were able to do that? They were firmly convinced that healing was part of the finished work of the cross. That when Jesus said, it is finished, that made an end to death. How many times have you heard by his stripes were healed? Is that healing only for a short time? Let me ask you a question this morning. I'm just, just to think, let me ask you a question. 
Would you like to minister in healing like A.A. Allen or John G. Lake, Amy Simple McPherson? Would you like to minister in healing like those of days gone by? Or would you be open? Is your mind at least open to a new revelation, a new bottle of wine, that the old wineskin of just healing would not be able to contain? Would you be open to a new revelation with the understanding that the results would be better than healing? John chapter 16, verse 12. Let me just open your understanding a little bit. John chapter 16 and verse 12. And this is where we're going to have to open up. If you're, if you're open to that, if you're at least willing to say, you know what? Healing was good. We thank God for healing. I'm down with healing. I've, I, I thank God for healing. I've been, I've been healed. Many of you out there have been healed. I'm a brother in Michigan that had brain cancer and he survived so fast. We both agreed that this was a God thing that, that kept my brother alive and is doing great today. Had, had brain cancer, probably not a great prognosis and the doctors were astounded. Thank God for healing. Thank the Father that he heals us. But is that the abundant life that Jesus came to give us? John chapter 16 verse 12 says this, I have many things yet to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It would seem that revelation is progressive, doesn't it? It's the spirit that searches the, the deep things of God and begins to convey them to us as we're able to receive them. I think there, there, are, there are days, there are generations of people that are, are being prepared to receive more revelation, deeper revelation than what we've ever received up to this point. And I thank God for that. That's good. That's good. There are things that I think that the spirit of truth as it's connected to Jesus, to the Father, the Father through the Son and the Spirit has things that they want to show us, to reveal to us. Let me give you just a real example of what I'm talking about. I have taught, I have taught out of the, the, uh, the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. I don't know how many times I've taught from that over my 50 plus years in ministry, it's, it's been a lot. But one day I saw something, I had, I'd be honest with you, I'd never seen it before. And since I've seen it, I can't unsee it. <clears throat> so I wanna share it with you, because I think this is what I'm talking about. When we're ready, he will show us something that's been there the whole time and we didn't realize it. It was the same with grace. Once, once you see grace apart from works, it's all over the scripture. You can't unsee it. You can't undo it. It's there and it becomes part of you. I saw something in, in John chapter 11 in verses 25 and 26. I've shared it a couple times. You may have heard it on the Digital Cathedral. I broke this out in Grand Rapids back in, uh, in September. This, this teaching that I'm doing this morning, I broke it in on them. It was the first time I ever taught along this line. And that's only been three, four months ago. But this is, this is part of what sprung me in this, that challenged me. It was like an aqua velva slap. Some of you old folks remember that. Remember that aqua velva slap? That's just what I needed. I saw some things in verse 25 and 26 of the story of Lazarus that I had never seen before. And there are two groups of people that Jesus represents. Now I want you to listen carefully as I read John chapter 11, verse 25. He's speaking to Martha. And he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now that's kind of where we've that's kind of where we're at today. Even, even if he if he dies, he will live. That's eternal life. That's what we have called eternal life. You have to die to get it. You die to enter into eternal life. But watch what he says in verse 26. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's not, e that's not eternal life, what we've called eternal life. That's immortality. That's not, that's not suffering death. That's not experiencing death. Does that mean that I always walk in this, this, this dimension that I'm walking in now? I don't believe so. I believe that's the dimension that Jesus is walking in right now. He's walking in this place of immortality. He has... His body has adapted to a different level of consciousness, but I think that his awareness is just as real and just as probably sharper than it was when he walked as the God-man on the planet, All right? Immortality, there's, there's life in that. 
There's, there's no death. There's no death mentioned in verse 26. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So death is not part of the equation in verse 26. Verse 25, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. There's room in verse 25 for healing. There's room in verse 25 for raising the dead, which Jesus did with Lazarus in this chapter. But verse 26 is an entirely new dimension. It's new wine. It's, it's, a, it's a slant. It's an insight that I've never heard anybody teach on. I'll be honest with you. I never, I've, I've had many friends, pastor friends. I've sat in teachings, ran through verse 25 and 26, but never drawn a distinction, never looked at the two groups that were there. And yet Paul said verse 26 of living and believing him but never dying, he said that it's part of the gospel. Paul understood it. I'm convinced of that. There were times that Paul should have been should have been killed, when when he was uh, beaten with a cat and nine tails. What three four times? I can't remember if it was three four times. That was administered by professional executioner. It wasn't just some soldier picked at random that that put a few stripes on Paul's back. That guy knew what he was doing. He was sad, he was a sadistic human being, and he enjoyed putting the punishment on somebody. The pain. The suffering and it was designed to kill him and yet it didn't kill Paul should have killed Jesus but it didn't because there was something in them that was stronger than death John was boiled in oil they could not kill John they couldn't kill him they finally put him out on the Isle of Patmos and just let this guy just isolated him until he transitioned John was the man who heard Jesus say, and he's the only one I believe that recorded this, in John chapter 10 and verse 17 and 18. I want to read that for you. John. This is what John had heard Jesus say, and I think it opened up the door, and John began to see some light in, in uh, John chapter 10 and verse 17. He heard Jesus say this, Therefore the Father loves me because I lay my life down. I lay it down that I may take it up again. No one, verse 18, no one takes my life from me. No disease, no sickness, no circumstance, no adversity, no storm takes my life from me. I lay it down to myself. This, this I think this is, see, this is the crux of the immortality message. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. Now this, I saw this this week. I never joined it together, but he said, this command I have received from the Father. So evidently the Father, in his, in the time that Jesus spent with the Father, remember he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. At some point, the Father gave John a command and said, a Jesus command and said, Jesus, I'm going to tell you something, son, my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. You're in a place where nobody can take your life from you. You have the power to lay it down. You have the power to pick it back up again. Can you imagine if that would enter into our inner man, what it would do to us when, if we knew that nobody was going to take our life, no accident could kill us? Paul got stoned. He got, I mean, the, the stoning that Paul got, nobody survives a stoning. They, they stoned Paul to the point they were, they were sure that he was dead. The last stone in the stoning is a huge stone. They go over, they throw it, they crush the man's skull. They were sure he was dead. They walked back to town. And what did Paul do? He got up and walked back into town. He did not die. He had the power to lay it down. He had the power to pick it up again. And what strikes me, what really struck me this week, is where Jesus said, this is the command that I have received from my Father. Do you think that we could absorb such a command are we open is our spirit open is our thinking open is our heart open that maybe we can hear that kind of command from the father and i said that jesus made this as part of the gospel and he really or paul made it part of the gospel and he absolutely did in second timothy watch this second timothy chapter one again i've never heard teaching on this until recently it's begin beginning to come to light lived all my life in church, and I, I will assure you, you never heard the tie-up with immortality in the gospel, but Paul lays it out. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He said, Jesus has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's an objective truth. Absolutely done. Saved in Jesus before time began. You probably never heard any teaching on that either. But it's now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So everything comes by revelation. They didn't, they didn't get verse 9, verse 10 says, until the revealing by Jesus. Now it says our Savior, Jesus Christ, now watch, who has, who has abolished death, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is part of the gospel message, Paul said. I, maybe Paul was wrong. Maybe he got it all screwed up. I don't think so, but that's what he told Timothy. And that word immortality means, you can check it out in the Greek. It means to be indestructible, incorruptible, not subject to deterioration, lacking the capacity to decay. That's pretty strong. Yeah, you know what? I guess I can say this to you at the Digital Cathedral. The more I study the depths of what the new creation is, we, we are a species of being that never existed on the planet pre-cross, pre-resurrection. We're, we're not just in, in, in an old Adam made over, renovated, restored. We are a brand new creation. We are a species of being that never walked on the planet before. The more I think about that, the more I pull out of Scripture and the more the Spirit of Truth shows me, the more I see that we have, we have not scratched the surface on what the Father has attended. The more I realize how far the church has missed what Jesus accomplished when he said, it, it is finished. Everything old passed away. Everything became new. And so we've got multitudes of people of which we were all part of in this church system that have remained blind, maybe ignorant is a better word, I, I, I'm not sure, of what the gospel contains and what we have as an inheritance as new creations. We've missed it by a mile. We have missed it by a mile. <clears throat> Let me just show you out of, out of scripture it, what I'm speaking about here this morning. See if this crystallizes a little bit for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 says this, for the, love of, for the love of Christ constrains us because we judge thus, that if Christ died for all, then all died. You've already died your death. If Christ died for all, then all died. We all died with Christ. So what are we doing dying again today? Good question, huh? Watch. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. As, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that the judgment, appointed unto man to die once. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, if Christ died for all, then all died. So we died our once. After that, the judgment, it says in Hebrews 9, 27, judgment took place at the resurrection. We were judged righteous, justified, holy, redeemed, new creation. We were, we were judged at the resurrection. You're not going to stand before God someday and him show a video of your life, all your embarrassing moments and everybody see. No, you've already been judged. He sees you, Ephesians 1, 1, 4 or 5, I can't remember which verse, says he sees you holy and unblameable in his sight because you've already been judged. And what the reason you've been judged is because you already died your death. It's pointing out a man wants to die and then the judgment. All right, one, one more quick verse. I'm just trying to lay this out for you. What I'm trying to do this morning is to just expand your thinking, just expand the possibility of what's going on here. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, physically dead, Jesus dead as a doornail, the spirit of him, capital H, spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, if that, that spirit dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life 
That word, that word is, is the word Zoe. It's an infusion of his life. He's, he will give an infusion of his life. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and it's infusing you with his life to your mortal, that subject to death body. He's infusing that, that mortal subject to death body with his life by his spirit who dwells in you. His spirit dwells in you. Paul taught us that the, that the Christ dwells in all of us. It's the Christ that raised Jesus from the dead. That spirit dwells in you and it's bringing life, immortality to your mortal body. There's been no generation that's been willing to say, hey, let's take a look at this. Let's see if this can, can possibly be real. And I'll tell you why we have not why we haven't given it serious consideration and why nobody has been bold enough to teach it. I'll tell you exactly why. The stumbling block is this. We have not seen people experiencing it yet. I didn't see people experiencing pure radical hyper grace either 25 years ago when I began to really see this revelation back at the turn of the century or turn of, uh, yeah, turn of the century. I wouldn't see anybody living out grace. Everybody was living a mixture. We believed we were obedient and believed God and made him happy. He would extend grace to us. That's how we viewed grace. Now I see it's totally apart from works and I can't unsee it. And I'm, what, I'm, what I'm seeing with this is there is a abundant life that Jesus came to give us. And the abundant life is not just getting sick, getting healed so that we can get sick again and die. Think about this. Here's what I'm, I'm trying to nail down at this point in the teaching. These truths we have to first embrace. If we're not willing to embrace it, we'll never believe it. Embracing comes before believing. You embrace a truth. You may not fully understand it. It may not be fully revealed, but you embrace it. And when you embrace it, that's when you crockpot it. That's when you hold it tight and you just examine it. You ask the Father about it. Ask the Spirit of Truth to show you. And that's when the believing takes place because it settles down. You begin to respond to what He shows you. And once that belief becomes strong, then you can begin to speak a creative word. I'm speaking a creative word to you. I'm speaking to your spirit this morning, and I'm saying, spirit man, come alive. Let that immortality, that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, let it quicken your mortal body. Let it, let it do something within your physical man beyond anything that you ever expected that is even better than healing. See, we believe it because it's truth. All truth we believe. We believe it because it's truth. And out of that belief comes experience. Now, never forget, what I'm teaching you is, is empowered. It's brought to light, into reality by the Spirit that Jesus said would lead us into all truth. What, what I'm teaching you is not a work of the flesh. What I'm teaching you is not something you can conjure up. It's not something you can force yourself to believe. It's not something that you can fast your way into or, or push your way into through hard prayer. No, 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 no. That's all works of the flesh. Jesus said over and over and over. And here again, when you start seeing this in Scripture, you see it all over. Jesus said things like this. John chapter 6, verse 47. The one who believes has eternal life. He said in, in John chapter 6, verse 51, I, and we're going to get into that sixth chapter of John next week because it is packed with immortality. Jesus said in John 6, 51, whoever eats this bread will live forever. He said in John 4, 14, the, the water I give to you shall become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. See, what, what's happened? What has happened? Why have we been bamboozled once again by religion to spiritualize all these things? We, we go way back to that passage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, when God said, day you eat it, you're going to die. Because Adam and Eve didn't die that day, we spiritualized. We said, a spiritual death. They died spiritually. No, they didn't die spiritually. How are you going to kill a spirit? The chapter before, the few verses before in verse 7 of the same chapter 2 of Genesis, God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. How His breath is his spirit. How are you going to kill the spirit that was breathed into human man by an action? You cannot kill spirit. You cannot kill God's spirit. 
as long as we think the way that we're thinking, we're going to get the results we've always gotten. What is that, the def definition of an insanity? If you continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that's crazy. And that's, okay, that's, as we shift, that's kind of what we have to shift out of. Because we've expected the same result to happen because of the action that we've, we've taken. What about Adam and Eve? What was the penalty? What did God specifically, exactly say was the penalty? It was physical death. And again, because it took them a long time, took th almost a thousand years for them to die, we just said, well, that must be spiritual life. They must have been dead spiritually. So everybody is born dead spiritually. That, there's nowhere in Scripture that says that man is a born spiritually dead. Paul said the wages of sin, of missing the mark, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, brings death. How many of us have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and didn't die that day. All of us. All of us. We've, we've missed the salvation from sin and its wage um, for a period of time, right? There's two parts to, to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Let, let, let me read that for you. I want you to see the two parts because, again, there's, there is a contrast that goes on. And when you start to see the contrast through Scripture, you start to see it in a lot of verses. Um, Romans chapter 6. Let me get over to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. You all know the verse. It says, for the wages of sin is death. There it is. Does the death come from God? No, there's no death in God for him to give it. He said it comes, you, you bring it on yourself when you miss it, when you eat from the wrong tree. So it's really pushing my, my spirit man's uh, expansion to go, okay, we get rid of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I, I wean off of that. Then does death have to also exit? The wages of sin is death, but, but, don't you love buts in Scripture? This is a big but right here. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So you got a contrast. You got the wage and you got the gift. Now, we've lived as though the, the wage was overpowering, that there's nothing we could do about the wage. But I'm going to have to ask you this morning, which, which part of Romans 6.23 do you believe? Do you believe the wage or do you believe the gift? If you're, if you're thinking you're going to die, but you believe the gift, you're double-minded. You're being double-minded. The wage of sin is death, but we're not, we're not going to hang in there anymore. We're coming over here to the gift, which is eternal life. And we receive that, not by praying a magic prayer, not by fasting, not by religious activity. We receive that and we enter into it as we eat from the tree of life. We hear what the Father says, we respond to it. If he doesn't speak, we don't, we don't act. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. The rest of the time he was still. He was quiet. Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 16, probably the most familiar verse in all of Scripture. You know the verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Does that verse say that He sent Jesus so that after you die, you could go to heaven and live? No, absolutely not. He said, Whosoever believes in Him should not perish should not perish. The word perish there is an interesting word. It's apolome. Apolome. The Greek word apolome. You know what the word perish means? It means to kill, to destroy, death being viewed as certain. Not spiritual death. He's not talking about spiritual death here. We've, we've taken that, we've extracted it and said, well, that means you're going to hell. If you don't believe in him, you're, you're going to hell. No, if you don't believe in him, then you perish. You experience death as being certain. And that's where we've lived today. That's where exactly where man has, has lived. And he got us out of that first part, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. He gets us out of that perishing in the last part of the verse, but says he will give us eternal life. Eternal life. 
life. Let me break that down just a bit for you. The Greek word eternal there is the word aeonius. It means, it means literally age long, that which lasts for an age. It's an adjective. And like all adjectives, they modify or describe the noun. It tells us more about the noun. So the word aeonius means it's an age long, an age long description of whatever the noun is. In this case, it's the life of God, it's Zoe. And there is, there is no expiration date on Zoe. So when we, when we talk about aeonius, Zoe, the age of the life of God, it would be an age that does not end because the noun, the Zoe, does not cease to exist. So the age will never come to an end. Are you following me? The life of God exists aeonius as long as the age of God continues, which is forever. There is no end to Zoe. So the Aeonius Zoe means there is an age of the life of God of which there is no expiration date. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, would not face certain death, would not experience it, but would have eternal life. A, a, a life that has an age to it of no expiration. Hope I'm making sense. Now the operative word in, in John 3.16 is the word believe. Believe is a verb, it's an action. Now here's where we've made a mistake. The believing is not our action. The believing is the action of the Father. It's the, it's the embirthing of faith. It's his action to us. It's, it's his responsibility to present the evidence to such a degree that we see it and we're convinced by it, therefore we respond. Believing is nothing but an effortless response to revelation. You cannot believe it till you see it. But when you see Aeonius Zoe, and when the Father convinces, he drops the evidence within you, and you say, I got it, I see it. I might not be experiencing it, I might not demonstrate it, I might not manifest it, but I see it, I'm embracing it. My believer is starting to grow because of what I'm seeing, and now I can no longer unsee it. When, when uh, here's, a good, here's a good illustration of it. It's in the life of Abraham. Uh, Romans 4.3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How could Abraham believe God? Because the evidence that God brought to Abraham was so overwhelming. It was so without uh, argument that Abraham responded to it. It, it was God's job to come to Abraham and convince him that he would be the father of many nations. He laid out all the evidence, all the arguments, and he knew just how to present it because he knew how Abraham was wired. He wired Abraham. He knew just how to present it, so Abraham believed it. It wasn't, it wasn't something where Abraham got down and just tried to strain to believe something. No, and that's what we've made belief to be. The boy, you better believe, you better believe. So we try real hard to believe, and you can't believe that way. The only way you can believe is what, what the Father unveils to you. So the action word, the verb, is an action on the part of the Father to bring to us an overwhelming evidence that will open our eyes, quicken our spirits, and we respond to it. How did Abraham, what did, how did Abraham respond? Romans chapter 4, verse 21. The whole thing's about this relationship, but it comes right down here to verse 21. It says, and being fully persuaded. See, here's the evidence that God gave. Being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to perform. So when I come to the time that I'm able, I'm totally convinced that God has promised the abundant life. He's, he's promised me immortality. He's promised me I don't have to die of sickness and disease. That I can, I can be like... Uh, a couple of men of the old, and I might mention them in a minute, spend a minute there. I can say, like Jesus, I lay my life down. I've run my race. I've finished my course. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I've done everything I need to do, so I'm ready to transition. It's not a fearful death. You're prepared for it. You're ready for it. And you just move 
to a higher level of sensitivity and consciousness than what you had while you got this flesh body. But it's not that you have to decay, become corrupted. It's not that you have to become decrepit, see, and get a disease and then, and then try to bleed for your healing. Healing's fine. Let me just say it again. I'm down with healing. I'm all for healing. But is that really the best? I need to be fully persuaded that what God has promised me, what Paul said was part of the gospel, belongs to me and that I can experience. So our part of immortality is the same as it was for Abraham in that 21st verse, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So let me, just, let me just challenge you in some of these areas. Let me just challenge you in your area, in this area of healing. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And again, I'm totally in favor of healing. Don't leave the digital cathedrals today saying, oh, that Keithley guy, he's tossed healing out. And you No, I'm all for healing. But is it the best? What, what's the point of healing? Does it really solve a problem? Honestly, does it really solve a problem or does raising the dead solve a problem if it means that we're simply going to have a little bit more span of life, get another sickness, another disease, and, and die anyway, miserable? Have we really solved a problem? Are we, are, we, are we really living the abundant life that Jesus promised? Or are we just procrastinating the inevitable? That seems like how we've lived. We just want to keep putting off the inevitable longer and longer and longer. So people do everything they can to fight and cling, to hang on to life. That's not abundant life. That's not quality of life. I mean, if heaven is the only goal, if the only reason the Father put us on this planet was to live some years, get sick, and die and make a U-turn and go back to heaven, if that's the point of the whole thing, that all we need is two people. We need an evangelist to help open our eyes, and then we could use an executioner or an assassin to cut our head off or pull a trigger and get us back to where we need to go. Why, why go through all, all that we go through in life? Does our loving Father, does He have something better? That's what I'm posing to you, and I think it's going to take me six weeks to get through this, so we're halfway. So all I'm, I'm proposing for your consideration, does the Father have something better for us? Is it in the realm of possibility? Because it seems to me that everything I've been indoctrinated with all my life has been preparing me to die, making sure I'm right with God, making sure I'm good to go, rather than how to live this life. All of our music in church is geared that way. Remember that song? One glad morning, when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. The whole rapture, all of that, is to get us out of this terrible life. Out of That's, that's not what Jesus came to bring to us. <clears throat> Evangelical theology is all around the hope of one day we can walk on streets of gold and look out over crystal seas and see these old fat babies with wings flying all over the place. The carrot is up yonder. And the stick that beats us is you better get right with God. You better stay right with God. Because one of these days you don't know when it could be. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. It might be five years from now. But one of these days you're going to stand before him. Wait a minute. That's not an abundant life. That's not what Paul taught us. Where does Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 come in? I'm, I'm, I'm winding down. Where does Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 come in? Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. We see Jesus. Do you see Jesus? He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, listen, might taste death for every man. That he by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. If he tastes the death for us, what, do I, what am I looking on the menu to try to get a taste myself? There's got to be a people that start to live on the planet that embrace this. Everything starts with embracing. That, that we won't have to go through uh, disease 
and sickness. Those things will not take our life. As Jesus is, so are we in this present world. I have the power to lay it down. I can pick it up, right? Then we can begin to believe it. Once we embrace it, we can believe it. And as we, as we become the believing that we know that we know that we know, just like the inclusiveness of the Father for all men, just like all men were included at the cross, we know that now. There was a day, man, that seemed so foreign, seemed so out of, out of touch. Yet now we embrace it. We embrace it. We believe it. Now we can speak it. I speak it. There's power. There's life. There's creativity in the word that we speak. And once we, once we believe it, we can speak it. I believe that the restoration of all things that the prophet spoke, including the life that was given at the very beginning, belongs to us. And we will experience at some point the defeat of the last enemy that rears its head because we've embraced it and accepted it and believed it and speak it, which is death. Amen? All right. I think that's good for this morning. Hope I've challenged your thinking, stretched you a little bit. I can almost see some of you shaking your head this morning as we went through this. Next week, we're going to take it all a little further. Next week, here's what I want to do next week. I want to look at Jesus teaching immortality. If Jesus didn't teach it, then why bother with it? Then... Um, then I think the week after that, I want to look at Paul, Paul teaching it. If Jesus and Paul agreed on this thing, then we got to really look at it seriously. Look at it seriously. Now, at this stage of the teaching, you're probably maybe fuzzy. I mean, I've spent hours thinking about this. I've spent hours researching through Scripture. I've looked at, you know, I looked at um, Enoch and Elijah. I've looked at 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the last enemy to destroy death. I've looked at the sting of death being removed. I've looked at all those things. So I'm, I, you know, I've probably spent more time in this than you have. So maybe at this point you're still going, well, I'm not, I'm not sure about all that. That's okay. That's good. All I'm asking is that you open up and if you see truth, if the spirit of truth begins to resonate with you about this, that there's something better than healing, something better than raising the dead, then I want you to just begin to think about it and let it stay open. Okay. Stay open. I've got questions. There's still mysteries I'm, I'm trying to see through the Spirit to be resolved. So we're on a journey. Remember, we're on a journey. We're traveling together. And the greater one that is in us, the Spirit of Truth, is going to take us to a good destination. All right, God bless you guys. See you back next Sunday morning. We're going to look at Jesus Looks at Immortality. See you Wednesday night. We'll talk a little bit more about this at The Secret Place. God bless all of you. And have a great week.